Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and the actions of our lives be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm about 98% sure that you have heard the gospel reading today before it was read in our worship service. In fact, I am quite sure that if somebody would have mentioned to you the story of the Good Samaritan, you may not remember every exact detail, but you probably had a pretty good idea what that story was about. However, I think it's one thing to be familiar with the story, that is to know the rough outline of it. It's a rather different thing to know truly what that story is about. And so this morning, I want you to think a little bit more deeply, not just about the story of the Good Samaritan, but what does that story really mean? What is it that Jesus is getting to? Now, you might think, well, Pastor, that's really actually easy because Jesus tells what it's about at the end, doesn't he? He simply says, go and do likewise. So you've heard this story about this Samaritan and how he gives compassionately and mercifully to this person who's beaten up along the road. That's what the story is about, that we are to be compassionate like that and to show mercy to others. Well, if you said that, I suppose in a way you're right. That's part of what the story is about. But if that's all you take away from the story, then this simply becomes a parable about ethics, about our behavior, about what it is that we should do. Really, the story in that sense is nothing more than a different way of saying what has already been said before in scriptures, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. The story about the Good Samaritan, that Samaritan who shows compassion and mercy, is truly a story of a man who didn't show limits for his love. He didn't say, these are some people that I must love, and these are other people who I don't need to love. This Samaritan saw somebody that needed help, that needed mercy, and he showed mercy. So, Again, if you think the story is simply about going and doing just like that Samaritan did, the takeaway for you is, well, who is it that I have limited my love to? Who is it that I am excluding from people that I need to love? And it's true, we all have some soul searching to do in that area. Who is it that you don't love? Is it Donald Trump? Is it Nancy Pelosi? Is it a Muslim? Is it an immigrant? Is it a police officer? Is it somebody who's poor? Is it somebody who's rich? You get the point, right? We divide the world up into all of these different groups, and some of those groups we like, and other groups we don't like. But this parable, Go and Do Likewise, teaches us to love without limits. We shouldn't limit our love to some people and not others. If you think about that parable, if you think about how it applies to you then, Jesus isn't saying, how are you doing? Are you doing pretty good with that love thing? No, he is issuing a command. He is hearkening back to that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And look, you're either doing that perfectly, or you're failing. And if you're failing, trust me, you're in good company. All of us are failing in it. None of us are perfectly following that commandment. We do show limits to our love. And if that's what the story of the Good Samaritan is about, it it kind of leads us to this problem So I want to challenge your understanding of the story of the Good Samaritan and say it it cannot simply be a story about ethics. It can't simply be a story about how we behave. Why? Well, first of all, if that's the way that you read the story, you see that it leads to this spiritual dead end. You have two responses possible 
to the story, if it's merely an ethical story, if it's merely about how God's law fits into your life. Either you say, I'm doing a really, really good job at this, and you start to become prideful. You start to say, I have it all together, which again, Scripture says is not true. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us is perfectly righteous. And again, God isn't asking how you're doing on the scale. He's saying, do you have it completely or have you failed? We've all failed. So therefore, the pride is not called for. Well, then that means that we're on the other side of this. We are people who are spiritually beaten up. We find that we have failed the test. And what does that do? It, it drives you to despair. You think, how could I possibly be saved? I haven't done what God requires. There's no hope for me. The end. So if that's how you read the story, I'm saying it doesn't lead us to a good place. You either are filled with pride and that's wrong, or you're filled with despair and that doesn't work either. But there's another reason why I don't think this is merely a story about ethics, about how we behave. That's the frame of the story. What's the context of the story? You see, Jesus doesn't just tell the story of the Good Samaritan out of the blue, does he? No, there's a reason why he tells it. In fact, there's a specific person that he's telling the story to. So what's that about and how does that help us understand the story? Well, there's a lawyer, that is to say, somebody who is an expert in the law of Moses, somebody who spent a lot of time studying God's commands, his word. This person comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, to you and me, we might say, wow, this person really is asking the right questions. They are thinking about what is the most important thing. But if you take a step back, and think about the question slowly, something doesn't quite compute. And Jesus obviously can see this. So Jesus could have responded, I think, to this lawyer's question, sir, you have the question all wrong. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't you see, you don't do anything at all. There's nothing that you can do to deserve eternal life. There's nothing you can do to merit eternal life. Don't you see eternal life is a gift that you receive. It comes out of the abundance of God's grace and mercy. Now Jesus could have answered that way to that man. It would have been truthful. It might have helped him see the light, but that's not what Jesus does. Instead, Jesus responds with a story. And in that story, I think Jesus has shown the answer to this man's question, but has done so in a much more memorable way, if he would simply understand what it is that Jesus is trying to say. So let's think about Jesus' story as an answer to this question. As I said, the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In one sense, the answer is nothing. You can't do anything to inherit eternal life because you're a sinner. However, just theoretically, if Jesus were to answer this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The correct answer is do everything perfectly. Show absolute obedience to God's word. Do everything absolutely perfect and you will inherit eternal life. The reason why Jesus wouldn't give that answer, though, is because that's not exactly helpful to this man. This man wants to know what to do, and Jesus trying to tell him you can't do anything, it just, it, it wouldn't have worked, I don't think. That's, that's what maybe Jesus was seeing or thinking. It's hard to know. It's hard to read Jesus' mind, but we have to think Jesus answers well. He knows what he's doing. Because here's the thing. Jesus is the one sinless one. He is the one perfectly obedient to God's word. So in other words, absolute obedience is theoretically possible, 
but not for us, not for us regular humans. It was only possible for Jesus, the sinless one, Jesus, the son of God, to be perfectly obedient. But in that scenario, Jesus is absolutely right. If you do everything perfectly, you do inherit eternal life. Jesus deserves everlasting life because he did everything perfectly. But what good does that answer do someone like you or me? Somebody who hasn't done everything perfectly. For, for you to hear that somebody else did everything doesn't help you because you've still failed the test. You're still sitting there in the ditch. Do you get it? Are you starting to see where Jesus is pointing this man? See, in the story of the Good Samaritan, we have this one character who is out of the ordinary and unexpected. In Jesus' day, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They spent their time living apart from one another. And in the few occasions when Jesus encounters a Samaritan in the Gospels, it's always with tension. There's, there's something underlying the, the, the connection and the conversation that you know this isn't right or this isn't normal. In the story, the Samaritan, this outsider, this unexpected one shows proper compassion and mercy to those who truly need it. To, to that man who is beaten up in the ditch and helpless. Now, if you can think about the story, doesn't that story remind you an awful lot about Jesus and how he has entered into our story? See, Jesus doesn't really belong among us. And in fact, in his own life, he was the outsider. He was the one who was rejected. He was the one despised by others, so much so that they put him to death on a cross, kind of like Samaritans were despised and outsiders in their day. And yet, nevertheless, Jesus is the one who showed that unexpected love and compassion and mercy on those who truly didn't deserve it. And aren't we an awful lot like that man in the ditch, like the one who is in need of help and assistance and near death and can do nothing to help or save ourselves. But Jesus comes near. See, Jesus shows a love truly without limits because he comes near those that others would think, hey, you shouldn't associate with those people. You shouldn't have anything to do with them. You belong in a different class altogether. No, Jesus comes near to us and he binds himself to us. He gives of himself so that we would be made well. And he makes the sacrifice of his time, of his energy, of his very life so that you and I would be nursed back to health so that you and I could live again, live a new kind of life, an everlasting life that wasn't possible for you and me. We couldn't have done that ourselves. What must we do? We could do nothing. But Jesus did everything. He heals us. He brings us back to life and gives us a new kind of life. See, Jesus shows a love absolutely without limits. His compassion and mercy knows no end. I think Jesus is the good Samaritan in the story. And, and if, if that's right, then that changes how you read and understand the story. Because then at the end, when Jesus says, go and do likewise, he's not merely issuing an ethical command. Do this perfectly or else. Rather, you have to understand what's going on in the story. And in the story, you have to understand that first, you're not the Samaritan. You're the one in the ditch. You're the one who can do nothing. You're the one near death. But you're alive. 
because of the Samaritan, because of his great sacrifice, because of his great love. And now, what do you take away from that? Just as that good Samaritan loved and showed compassion, you must also show compassion. But see, that's more than simply an ethical command. It's part of who we are. Jesus gives us his own life so that we would be more like him. Jesus doesn't just give us a model that we should follow, a command that we must fulfill. He has done all things perfectly. We follow in his footsteps. And we follow in his footsteps no longer under our own power, no longer living our own life. We live because he gave his life for us. See, we follow his footsteps. We are like him. And it's not just that he's that example, is it? No. He is our strength. He is our life. He is our compassion and mercy. Go and do likewise. Yes, it does tell us how we should live in this life. But it's not merely an ethical command. It's a reminder that God first showed a love without limits to us. We are alive because of him and through him. And now that life, that love, that mercy should flow out of us to the people around us. And we dare not limit his love. We dare not say only some people deserve this mercy. Only some people deserve this grace. No, it's a love without limits. And it is not our love that's the basis of eternal life. That's what the lawyer had wrong in the story. Jesus wants to correct that and say, the only reason you have any life at all is because of what I have done for you. Though you have rejected me, though you treat me like an outsider, and as Jesus loves his life into us, he calls us to live that love into others. Do we do it perfectly? No, none of us do. But it's in returning to him, to his love, to his grace and his mercy, that once again, you see this? It repeats, he fills us up and sends us out. Go and do likewise. You have life because of Jesus. You have love because of Jesus. Now share that love without limits. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ, our Lord and risen Savior. Amen. <laughs>